The second flower I want to draw to your attention is also a plant of woods and hedgerows. Uh, coming to the end of its flowering season now, but one of the advantages of that is that we can see it at different stages of its development. And this is wild arum, which is a member of a family, about 1,200 species worldwide, um, and it has a completely distinctive pollination strategy. In fact, when you look at it, um, you wonder if it should be considered called a flower at all. It's so different from more familiar flowers. But the reason for that is that the uh, arum belongs to a family which split off from most other more familiar flowering plants at a very early stage in the evolution of flowering plants. Um, you see there are no sepals and no petals. All you can see on the outside, in fact, is this kind of cowl-like structure, uh, which wraps around uh, a sort of central column for which the technical term is the, sp the spadix. The cowl itself is technically referred to as a spade. So if we open up the plant, you can see that the column is made up of a, a number of quite distinct and different zones. You have that pillar at the top there. Uh, and then below that, below that, you've got a zone of downward pointing hairs. And below that again uh, is a purplish ring of stamens, of uh, anthers to be more, more precise. And then there's a little bald ring, and then below that again, there's a zone of abundant carpels. So that's the basic structure of the flower. Now, when the flower first opens, if we take another specimen from over here, and this is well ad ad advanced, but when the flower first opens, uh, that pillar at the top begins to emit uh, an odour which to our relatively undiscriminating uh, noses would, would, would smell like cow dung. Uh, and at the same time, the temperature rises to, uh, to an extraordinary degree, 15 to 20 degrees above its, its, its surroundings. And that only happens uh, when the flower begins to open. It opens around, around, around midday. Uh, it begins to emit this odour and, and gives off, uh, off the, this heat. And that attracts, that attracts sm small flies, which make their way into the cowl and then end up in that constricted chamber uh, at the base. And if they're carrying pollen from a visit to a, a, an earlier flower, what happens is that they, th that pollen will rub off on the carpels at the bottom here, uh, fertilizing uh, the, the, the carpels. That all happens during the first day. And about a day afterwards, what then happens is that the stamens uh, liberate their pollen and the flies become dusted with this, particularly because uh, the carpels exude a sort of sticky substance which, which helps the pollen grains to stick together and to adhere to the bodies of the flies. Uh, and then shortly after that then, the hairs at the top begin to wither and wilt away, permitting the flies to escape. And they then presumably will move on to another plant and repeat the process there and uh, cross-pollinate that different plant. But perhaps the most extraordinary thing about this whole story uh, is that if you look at those flies more carefully with a microscope, you'll see that they, all, they belong, almost all belong to a single species of, of small, small mage. And uh, more extraordinarily still, uh, they're all female. Uh, the, the name of the mage, it doesn't have an English name, it's an undistinguished sort of little fly, is Psychoda phalaenoides. And the reason for the, the attraction is that even though it just simply smells like cow dung to us, it, it has a very specific signal for these female midges because it precisely mimics the odour of the, uh, the, the habitat in which they deposit their eggs, which is cow dung at a certain stage of development. And sometimes these midges can occur in their hundreds, as you can see here in this particular plant. There are hundreds of these little psychotic midges. All females thinking that they have visited their egg depositing site. <laughs>